Hello, everyone, and welcome to High on Films. My name is Virat Nehru, and I'm a long-time film programmer and critic. Ahead of the Australian premiere of Joram, I was able to catch up with director Devashish Makhija. Now, Joram is a very interesting film because, on one hand, it is a survival thriller, but within that template, it's able to ask some very important questions about the way we live and the social contract citizens have with the state. Some very interesting questions around who gets to be the beneficiaries of progress crop up within the mainstream template of one person trying to survive against all odds. The film stars Manoj Bajpai and Muhammad Zishan Ayub in the lead roles. And it's such an interesting film that within the genre template is able to do so much more. Now, I don't want to spoil the film any further, so I wouldn't say much more. But you really, really should watch the film. It's a really interesting film and it's playing at the Geomami Mumbai Film Festival. And it's also been announced that it will have a wide release come December. The chat that you're going to hear between myself and Dave, how Joram came about, what the film was supposed to be, and what the final product ended up becoming. And basically, the kind of process that a film goes through and the research that goes behind making such a film. I thank Dave for his wonderful insights and a lot for his time. The next voice you'll hear will be us discussing Joram. Hope you enjoy the chat. So thank you so much, Dave Ashish, uh, for joining us for this chat. I've seen uh, your work now from Tandav to Ajji to now Bhosle and now Joram, this mm. is uh, like a long, long journey. There are a common themes, there are a lot of but first I want to uh, get to the genesis of this, you know, hybrid Naxalite story or a fish out of water story and combining it with basically, I love the recurring motif of uh, Prakati Nagar and Prakati Minds and the idea of basically who actually is the beneficiary of progress. And this question mm-hmm. keeps pop- popping up throughout the film in different ways. But before we get into the kind of thematic elements of the film, let's get to the idea that Joram, uh, where did it originate? The genesis of the film came from where or how long did it take to gestate? What is the gestating period? Because uh, the research and the kind of particular dialect work and everything that's gone behind the film, it, it wouldn't have been a quick fire process. It's my time. Laga yoga. Like, I can imagine the kind of gestating would have gone through. They would have taken some time. So these are always very difficult questions to answer because like you said, uh, even if there aren't recurring themes in my films, there is a recurring uh, uh, overarching prerogative, the questioning of the system and that one character or two characters who are uh, who are representing a certain section that is marginalized when it comes to talking about the equitable distribution of wealth and justice. So those are recurring prerogatives for me. So with the tribal situation, I've I've been researching it and I've been uh, sort of an activist from a distance in that situation for the tribal rights for almost 15 years now. In 2010, I had uh, had taken a trip to uh, Chhattisgarh North Andhra and South Odisha, which was just starting to sort of uh, flare up the whole Maoist situation there. Okay. I didn't know why I was going. I was just going because I had I was obsessed with trying to work these questions into my stories. And you can read how many of the perspectives you want from the um, from newspapers and magazines, journals and books. But what you see with your eyes and what you smell with your nose and what you taste with your tongue... Nothing replaces that. So I went there embedded with a journalist who used to write for the New Indian Express. Okay. Just so I could experience this firsthand. So I came back with, uh, I mean, five weeks there and I came back with enough material for four lifetimes because I, I, I mean, how much ever I talk about this situation, how many other things I say, how many of people I hope to move won't be enough. So the first, story that sort of emerged out of me after many failed attempts, the first story that successfully sort of emerged out of me was a film called Unga, Uh which was 11 years ago. My first film, so to speak, after many failed attempts. 
but it didn't turn out the way I wished it would because it was the first time producer he and I sort of fell out during the making of it and he took control because in my contract I'd signed away all rights to him because I didn't know better so he sort of it got shot the way I didn't want it to be shot it got edited by him I was not in the edit room so I distanced myself from that film and in the interim I started dabbling with other stories but all of this material was still inside me because that film never never got released it didn't really travel it didn't do anything it just disappeared so I wrote Joram again I wrote this script not for myself I wrote it for yeah. someone else in a very different form it was a <laughs> more me to the more Prakash Jha kind of uh, yeah. film okay. so if I see yeah. that I know everyone from in India gets it what those beats must have been uh-huh. and what that tree must have been what that act structure would have been like what uh-huh. that hero at the center of it what his journey would have been like because mm-hmm. all of those films at the end of the day Rajniti Apharan they're all they're all archetypes they're all yeah. very similar archetypes that he goes through over and over again I had written that film but again that okay. didn't get made thankfully and then uh, <laughs> Manoj and I <laughs> Manoj and I, we made Tandav, we made Bosle, and Bosle, when it released in 2020 in the middle of the lockdown, uh-huh. we didn't expect the kind of uh, response it got. We thought yeah. we made a slightly art house film and that it'll be watched by a niche and it'll disappear. But it just mm-hmm. became the sleeper uh, OTT hit of that year. And 100 yeah. people wanted to do something with Manoj and me again. So I revived this. I'm like, here is the script. And Manoj had read it and he had seen oh, potential in okay. it. He said, but I will not make any other one. You direct it, you say. So I said, but the state that it is in, I don't think I'm the right director for it. So let me make it my own. So I took that script back from whoever I wrote it for. And I started sort of re-sculpting it and making it mine. Taking, weeding out all the Prakash Jha elements and bringing <laughs> how much ever of me I could into it. So for example, when I say this, the f- one fun fact. So the... The Lachia song, the uh-huh. Muchaki becomes Lachia. In a Prakash Jha film, that would have been an item number. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. In, I didn't dislodge the, the item number. In fact, the way uh, you approach it in the first 10-15 seconds, you know, there is a deliberate uh, misleading and the red herring is that. It is setting up the yes. item number and you're like, Achha, theek hai. you know, this is this is where the item number yeah. is supposed to be and it'll be. so. And even that Absolutely. reveal is very interesting and how the item number actually becomes very uncomfortable as it progresses. So it, it sort of like almost uh, sort of reverses on its head. Absolutely. That was very, I mean, I would not call it funny, but it was more and more disturbing the longer it went on. So I didn't dislodge the song. I just subverted mm. it. Yeah. So I, I, some of the tropes, I played to the tropes to see if I can play to it and then subvert your expectation of that trope. So that was what I did with the script. So like you rightly said, it was it's a process. So in the case of Joram, if I trace it back to my trip to uh, Odisha, Chhattisgarh and uh, Andhra, then it's a 13-year journey. And the mm-hmm. story, when I wrote it originally, it was set in Odisha. So it would have yeah. been half in, uh, not Odia, but in Kuvi, which is a Dungriya Kone dialect of uh, a tribal dialect in Odisha. Odisha has 270 tribal dialects, some of mm-hmm. which have nothing in common with Odia. So that mm-hmm. is the world I want to take it to. But then a studio came in and a, a studio needs a film when they're setting it up uh, at a certain scale. They need to be able to pitch it at a certain scale. So I can't yeah. then make a very art house bilingual film that becomes mostly a subtitled experience. Mm-hmm. So then I, I located the film to Jharkhand. So that was another rewrite. And then I went to Jharkhand looking for what will the local language sound like which could be understandable by a Hindi-speaking audience, yet feel like a dialect. So mm-hmm. the dialect you hear in the film doesn't exist. So we've picked from three or four dialects and woven yeah. our dialect. So yeah. it so it's it's many stages. It's not like this. This dialect was not there at a script level. It was there okay. once I entered pre-production with the people, with the actors who were workshopping the rest of my actors, and we collaboratively sort of came up with this dialect. I want to go back to this very interesting insight uh, which you raised. Okay, initially this was a Prakash Jha kind of a trope film, mm-hmm. uh, and I want to basically go back to this, uh, which is in every Prakash Jha film, the the hero narrative that you said. So you know, if if this was a Ganga Jal type of a film, uh, Muhammad Jisan uh, Ayub's character Ratnakar would be very different to what he yeah. is eventually. So, but I liked 
how you subverted it i mean i mean we've seen this kind of a uh, outsider coming in kind of narrative as well in a lot of films recently abhi article 15 in a is a yes, recent yes. example i can think of Absolutely. but even there you are managing to subvert it because he doesn't come with a savior complex he yeah. comes in with an understanding of not knowing anything in an area where he's going to be it is more a uh, probably panchayat is probably a closer uh, uh, sort of you know uh, i guess uh, example that i can think of where he probably doesn't even want to be there he you know he just happens to be there knowing the pragasha template how did you kind of manage ki i want to do that but also do it my way what was your take on that template because uh, the pragasha beats as you said are very set one of which actually we already answered i just uh, very actively made him reluctant someone who <laughs> simply does not want to have anything to do with this he has uh-huh. enough problems of and someone who is reluctant then goes on a uh, in most tropy films it go he goes on a on, on an arc to become the savior and here i would i took him on an arc yes but i used him only and only for being the eyes of the audience because the primarily the audiences of such films are city dwellers and since 2010 most people who i speak to in the city not only are uh, i mean i I'll, i don't mean to sound arrogant here i will exclude myself from them because i have taken so many years to try and understand the situation not only are most people ignorant of what is happening most people actually feel it's okay what is happening they are like why are people getting in the way of development and therefore yeah. through a film like this like you said we question who is this pragati for and the person who represents you from the city is actually going on the journey of understanding ki who is this pragati for so that was my primary and only agenda for ratnakar but when ratnakar comes in the reluctance i didn't wanted to only feel like a like a very superficial reluctance like you or me going there and being reluctant why yeah. what is making ratnakar specifically reluctant so there is something that is uh, not very overt in the film but it's something i gave the actor to play with so if you notice in the film he's called bagul by his senior mm-hmm. his name is ratnakar bagul which is a dalit name it's a dalit surname so he is really at the bottom of the food chain in the police force in the city and when he goes to jharkhand to this in middle of nowhere he is not at the bottom of the food chain anymore and now he is mm-hmm. being told to kill someone who is the bottom of that food chain but he knows what it's like to be at the bottom of a food chain and that's where the resonance starts he is not just someone who's starting to become large of heart he just knows what it's like to live at the bottom of a food chain but it's interesting that you you've kind of managed to flesh out this uh, invisible uh, sort of uh, line you know where people yeah. think that this is the bottom of the food chain and to realize that there are even people below that that you thought that you had the worst of it and then yeah. the, you you meet other people who had even worse you know and uh, uh, the tribal situation and how it film is really presenting it it is very much that that uh, there are different forces at play which are manipulating uh, the i guess the people the situation the environment for their own agendas and there are so many agendas at play that you don't really know in the end which agenda is the right one i mean the the complexity of that is 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 really is. interesting that you can't tell which agenda is really the one to follow because everything gets mixed up and muddled up and creates its own different agenda like you know even the people with their agendas can't even control the final outcome eventually yes thank you for catching that because that is something i mean no one has caught it so eloquently like you have just now but it's one of my favorite things to do and i got a chance to do it in all its glory in joram you know uh, like if you see films that are similar in prerogative like avatar the mm-hmm. the the entire onus is placed squarely at the threshold of the capitalist industrialist ki iski greed ne sabki sorry for my language ma jodbi but <laughs> if you yeah. actually read between the lines in the real world for example this government i will not i will not yeah. Uh, yeah, pull yeah. its punches this government is so is so frothing at the mouth with the minority because of the 70 80 year of a vendetta that they're on so somewhere huh. vendetta sort of ties in with uh, development ties in with capitalist greed ties in with many prerogatives and becomes this very complex beast and you don't know when you start going up against this beast where do you begin 
Mm-hmm. And that frustration, that helplessness pushes somebody to pick up the gun. Because you don't know where to start talking. Do I first talk to this woman who's on a vendetta? Or do I talk to the industrialist who only understands profit? Or do I talk to the leader who's coming with 50 years of his own, uh, you know, grudges? Who do I talk to first? What what do I, what is this in this chain? What is this link that I tap and this chain will go? You don't know. And everywhere you start going to talk, those doors start shutting and you realize that, you know what, in this lifetime, I don't know where to begin. So let me just pick up the gun. Either I'll shoot somebody or I'll shoot myself. And mm. somewhere I wanted to give a sense of that. So what you're saying that there's so many intertwined agendas that you ha- that I'm hoping that the viewer feels a little helpless by the end. That's when you start asking the right questions. I, I think uh, you you put the finger uh, basically on the point itself, and it's slightly disturbing to think because eventually, I think uh, from a politically aware or a politically conscious or even if there is a left-leaning liberal audience, there is a certain kind of, you know, I wouldn't say arrogance, but there is a certain certainty, you know, that I know what I'm fighting for. I know what I'm standing up against. I know the people who are actually vulnerable. I know the people I'm representing. But the film is very uh, astute in its sense. And I love the kind of, uh, I guess, the film's own political murkiness where it is managed to kind of even disturb both sides of politics. Uh, And in that sense, the film is actually more politically complicated than a lot of people would like to admit. So even the sort of uh, liberal uh, left-leaning people would themselves also find areas which they might not be comfortable with. Because uh, the truly vulnerable uh, are people that we don't really know. And even if when we know uh, who they are, that is one representation of what we've been shown. So, and, and the film is able to capture that there are many sides to it that we're not aware of. And there is, I guess, a humility in accepting that you don't know. Uh, and I guess that's where the real uh, the battle begins. And this is where eventually, sometimes it's purely survival. And that is that is if I can what just, matters. If I can take this thought forward, because it's yeah. uh, something like uh, taking it forward and taking two steps back to make my, yeah, my yeah. point. Like on Aji, uh, some of the most uh, astute audiences I had were uh, activist women, lawyer women, who put me Mm -hmm. in the dock for that film, saying that A, you don't have a vagina, two, you don't know what a woman goes through with the, you know, her own rape or the rape of someone close to her. And you don't, I mean, you don't know that we actually don't want to see stories of surviving. We want to see, see stories of moving on. So you don't mm. actually know what it, it's like to be a victim or a survivor of rape. So that mm. got me thinking over all these years, even with the Adivasi situation. So I converted Unga into a novel, a young adult novel, three years back. Okay. okay. Won the top young adult fiction award. Uh, and it sort of got me into conversations with tribal activists. Mm. And okay. they also started questioning me very similarly to the way I was questioned by women during Aji. Mm-hmm. I started getting questioned by uh, very, very erudite tribal minds saying that where do you come off being a non-tribal uh, you know showing the tribal constantly as a victim of violence we are much more than that it's only your city lens that sees the tribal only in that that limited scope because you don't know what else we are about because you only get all moved and uh, you know uh, affected and disturbed when you see a, viol- a violence being perpetrated on a tribal but we are about a lot more and the more you show this narrative again and again in your films through that privileged city lens, the more you're perpetuating our state. You're not uh, you're not letting the world know us beyond victims of violence. So, of course, yeah, Joram, it, it becomes a cycle of violence porn. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, Joram is guilty of, again, to some extent, being seeing a tribal through that lens. But I, I, call, I call myself a work in progress. So through this film... I'm trying to at least look at the the avenues of violence as so complicated that it's mm-hmm. not a very simple binary. You can't just walk in there as a non-tribal, place yourself in that chain and say, you know what, I know who's doing this. I know who's suffering. I'm going to fight for who's suffering against who's doing it. It's not that simple. It's probably a 2000 year history of violence. The British yeah. also did violence on the tribal absolutely similarly to all the post-independence governments did. Their life has not changed. The rest of India's life has changed post-independence. Yeah. 
and it's very so, complicated so keeping the next story i talk uh, i talk about the situation in it may not be a story of violence i'll probably try mm-hmm. to go deeper than just this narrative of violence so it's very yeah. complicated and most left liberals they like you rightly said they very conveniently place themselves i am a left liberal too but i keep pushing myself to see it for the complex mess that it is and asking questions might take a lifetime you may, may not get answers in this lifetime but mm-hmm. we need to keep asking the right questions and we are so focused on finding sexy answer that you know the questions <laughs> get left by the side you know sexy answers yeah. like are he yeah. guilty of revenge it's a sexy yeah. answer therefore in this uh, film i made the villain the one on a revenge trip because it's a sexy yeah, yeah. answer yeah. and it will yeah. destroy you it's not I really mean, an answer i mean there is also a question to be asked whether that character is truly the villain or basically exactly. the true villain are the sort of invisible yeah. forces at play and there are many yeah. forces at play you know and so you can't really pinpoint a person or a a living being as a villain it's the mechanism uh, of how everything comes together which creates the villainy because you know you can't really say if the mechanics of how the positive progress of capitalism works which creates this uh, dichotomy uh, who is guilty of, of that if or if everyone is in some ways guilty in that sense absolutely so uh, and that is a more complicated uh, sort of thread to unravel because you pull at one thing and everything keeps unraveling after that <laughs> and it doesn't happen in 2 years 4 years therefore it's like a 14 year research and understanding journey that led to this film yeah um, and uh, what you rightly said uh, the people uh, are just not aware of uh, grassroots politics of of grassroots issues so you know i mean in that sense the general awareness of a lot of these issues is quite uh, has recessed over years as you said so i guess this is more uh, as you've already accepted i guess you're trying to establish a checkpoint okay, okay we've come this far and let's let's uh, put a line in the sand here and then we can progress from this narrative we've established this much we've we've come this far we we've, we've been reeducated now let's move forward from this point onwards uh, but even that itself today feels it shouldn't be but it feels as if it is uh, too much to ask <laughs> yeah yeah because we've gotten so used to the fruits of development like i i am not i'm not blind and i say this very often in a lot of interviews i'm not blind to the irony of me mm-hmm. saying that uh, and hence i try to not keep it so so over simply bipolar my mm-hmm. my political stance because if i really believe that forest should not be cut and tribal uh, habitat should not be touched what the fuck am i doing living in a 2 bhk in the middle of andheri and talking to you on a macbook pro look at my carbon <laughs> footprint you yeah. give me the right to say that forest should not be cut yeah i should bring my carbon footprint down to zero and then make those claims yeah. so those are not sustainable ideas anymore because of the where the world has reached the sustainable ideas are very complex they are discourses they are dialogues and they are constant work in progress dialogues which no one seems to have the stamina for uh the other other thing which i wanted to touch upon which has come through your responses actually is this uh, i feel and i I've, i've read almost all of your films as kind of subliminal horror stories you know uh, you know whether like there is a get out or a nope or the kind of jordan peel uh, kind of sentiment where the, the system is in some ways the horror uh, almost whether it is ajji whether it is bhosle or it is joram uh all your main protagonists are caught up in a horror story of their own and they have to escape uh their their kind of very own personal horror story so much more i mean we've kind of touched upon the political which is kind of a macro aspect but in a very personal way these characters uh, don't really care about the politics of it all they just care about their own personal uh, you know uh, yards and the kind of their own lakshman rekha that they have to protect because and the people that fall within it and and for a lot of people that that is the incentive and that is very much the incentive for all of these characters whether it is ajji whether it is uh, in bhosle and whether it is here uh, with uh, bala and uh, you know uh, i would not go, i would not give away the uh, title reveal because that is very important to the film as well but basically you know all these characters are protecting their inner worlds per se and for them that is the horror story about how do i a protect my dear loved ones in this 
environment and climate where they are threatened by everything and everyone around them and i can't say for sure where is safety and where is uh, safe harbor again article 15 prakash jha's films all of those films and um, uh, it's not like i don't enjoy them i quite like <laughs> the fact that there is an there is a prakash jha and abhav sinha out there who who unflinchingly and relentlessly keep putting politics front and center in the story mm-hmm. but where i as a storyteller uh, i mean i i have chosen a different path is that i i believe that my film can move people if i place human drama and human uh, survival the, the the desire to survive at the center and right at the front of the story and everything else becomes a tapestry at the back the minute the politics takes a takes even that one step forward and maybe stands shoulder to shoulder with the the human dilemma i start i feel that i'll start to alienate uh, viewers because mm-hmm. ultimately that father feeling uh, trying to protect a daughter that that old man trying to you know avenge uh, a young girl that grandmother trying to avenge her little girl those are so universal that no matter which country or which culture you show those stories in those films in people will connect once i have them then i apply them with the politics but if i make the politics front and center anyways my films are i mean i don't have the i don't have the crutches that prakash jha and anurag sinha have they come from television they come from main the mainstream they work with big stars so they have the dressing to reel you in anyways mm-hmm. they know where to place a song they they use sentimental music they pitch their performances up they have dialogue bazi i have no dialogue bazi in my films my protagonists mm-hmm. barely speak so i don't have those things to rely on so the only thing that i rely on is that in my story the the human conflict the human drama the desire to survive will be front and center and if you choose to be blind to the politics my film may still work for you but once i reel you in i'm hoping that my story is involving enough to not let you leave without thinking about the politics that i'm now you know th- yeah. sort of thrusting down your throat once i have you i mean that that's an interesting uh, insight that you're saying that you want the film to work on both levels someone who isn't interested in the politics of it all doesn't want to take deeper and you know have a self reflective existential crisis afterwards and someone who does and you know it it should work for both of these people uh is is that is it basically uh, selling your own work short in some ways by no, appealing I'll, to I'll, that I'll flip yeah. that. So I've been, okay. I've been. The word compromise has been thrown at me a lot over the last okay. five, six years. <laughs> okay. It's not a compromise. So what I, I, I strongly have uh, believed only in the last few years, because I've taken many years to arrive at this idea as well mm-hmm. and this prerogative, that mm-hmm. if I, yes, it is not a compromise. It is a recalibration. I, I admit. Mm-hmm. But if I stood my ground and put my politics front and center, like I saw it. i am standing in an echo chamber only people who agree with me will walk into my film because they will yeah. know already what my film is talking about but if i mm-hmm. don't do that and i take this extra effort to recalibrate which you can actually you have the right to see it as a compromise then mm-hmm. people walking into my film actually don't know exactly what my political stance is until they have finished watching the film mm. so then i'm not in an echo chamber anymore i have managed to get someone who does not agree with me into the hall then two out of 10 people may start thinking about what i what i'm talking about even though they didn't agree with me earlier yeah. eight may still continue to want to disagree but i've actually shifted two people a little bit so i've gone mm-hmm. beyond my echo chamber yeah is that it is necessarily uh, basically a by product of the very polarized world we live in and that people just have preconceived ideas of uh, how yeah. much they have been fed from their respective bubbles that Absolutely. you know that And so the only way to cut across is perhaps uh, keep them in the dark <laughs> yeah. as long as like possible. Like short films, like I don't know if you've seen my short film Agli Bar. Yeah, I've I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. I've only seen Tandav. Agli Bar. I made it the year the BJP came to power, and it's it's okay. political. So political is like wrapping you on the nose. Political. I didn't okay. hold back. But as the BJP continued to be in power, and my feature film started getting made, I realized that we are so polarized. i can't be doing that because i will not uh, i will not affect anybody i will not mm-hmm. i will not make make any mark to the people who don't agree with me then what am i doing talking to the people who already agree with me what am i going to achieve then why am i a filmmaker then i should be out there being an activist or i should be <laughs> policy making 
why am i yeah. carrying all this rage and all this perspective what am i going to do with it if i'm not being able to talk to those who don't agree with me or yeah. start a dialogue yeah this no, happened uh, you're right because of this government yeah yeah uh, and i mean like you mentioned uh, and very rightly so that you said that you're a filmmaker first and you know you should be an activist uh, an activist second probably uh, from a filmmaking point of view what i what i really love uh, changing track is the fact it's it's beautifully shot i mean uh, technically it, it's such a beautiful film in terms of how it looks i mean if if i keep all the politics aside if i keep all the kind of uh, issues that it's provoking within me the reason it is able to do that is because it is in it is a well technically well made film and and i've had this discussion uh, uh, plenty of times uh, with a lot of people about you know uh, other emotive films which i'm not going to name which have made you know are quite successful and made a lot of money and uh, but for me they are badly made films and i'm just like you know the, the reason i don't like them isn't because of the politics of the films they can have whatever politics they need to be but the problem is they are just badly made they, uh, on a technical level they are just haphazardly put together they are not they are barely a film for me there are <laughs> just a bunch of sequences stitched together and they're not doing anything so from that perspective uh, what i love about joram is that we are having this massive uh, political discussion which i wasn't uh, actually you know i didn't come in with that perspective because my first uh, kind of you know what i was taken in by was gosh the, you know all the the setting of this this is a very low key uh, felt like i was watching a low key malayalam film like uh, kumbalangi lights uh, sequel or something because it was the setting of that place just takes you in and you're like oh my goodness this is a a beautiful beautiful place and uh, uh, and and you feel for that place because uh, that's when it starts to pick you because you're like okay there is such beauty in in this and there is such depravity hiding within that beauty that you're not aware of and that's when it starts to play the subconscious starts to pick you because of the technical achievement of the film the politics is something that comes in secondary because and the politics is effective because you are taken in by the craftsmanship of the film and which is why my stance is always you know a film has to work as a film first and and not a political yeah. statement if i had to do that i'll listen to a speech or i'll listen to something else so Absolutely. you know from Absolutely. that perspective Same. i think primarily you know words that i spout on them you know so primarily uh, let me acknowledge that this works as a technically beautiful film to look at uh, and it works primarily the social messaging is effective mostly because i like how the film looks and i'm invested in the film in the characters and not because of mm. the social messaging the social messaging is effective because i am invested in the characters and how the film looks if i wasn't that then whatever social message the film would have carried i, I would i would be browsing on my phone or scrolling or doing something else and yes. not even looking at the screen so how will the film work so from right. that perspective uh, i think uh, you know to talk a bit about uh, the fact that obviously i don't know what kind of budget you had but uh, the film looks incredible uh, in how it's shot in the kind of framing choices that you've made and you made sure the setting of this place really takes you in nothing happens so serendipitously there are no such yes. moments of magical synchronicity the fuck you milia they happen <laughs> but at smaller levels yeah. when you prepared yourself at the larger level yeah so like i said earlier the story was supposed to be set in odisha and my first film unga was set in odisha as well so i had i had uh, uh not just research odisha i i knew odisha because of all those scripts and all that research down to its bare bones so coming to this one very basic shift at at a dna level in the politics in the political framework of this film and hence the film itself in odisha the entire battle is about bauxite mining and from bauxite is made aluminium but in jharkhand yeah. the entire mining is iron ore mining from which comes steel aluminium has a very different politics to it steel has a very different politics to it so when you start and these are very subliminal things like if i tell you you may not even be able to you know wrap your head around so how does the film change but at a dna level what those characters are fighting against what they are fighting for how their lives are going to change and what that chain of of events and violence from the earth to the power corridors is very different if you set a story in odisha you set a story in in jharkhand that's mm -hmm. only because i like to build from the nut bolts up i don't like walking in somewhere and superimposing something on that place 
so all so when i had to transpose it from odisha to jharkhand we did a, a lot, sort of a research recce me and a couple of my assistants and i started letting jharkhand speak to me so i wasn't really looking for locations locations there and that's when i started recalibrating the story recalibrating the characters and those locations started popping up in a very research way and that's something i do then i start working that into my script when i redraft it so then when we go looking for locations it's already on paper so the people looking for locations then when they read it they're like are yahi to hai you're so lucky i said no i wrote this into it. so now when you're mapping it it seems like this was already there and it's serendipitous it's not i wrote it okay. into the script so it happens in stages so when you see that beauty and that scale and you see like i had a phenomenal cinematographer who his work before joram and his work in joram are vastly different because he was hungry and he surrendered to the process gave me 5 months of his life and we sort of let the world that's what i try and do i let the world and the characters the actors who become the characters talk to us and that dictates how the camera will move how fast it will move how much it will shake will it shake will it not shake so it sort of gets dictated by the characters in the world so all of these things can only sort of integrate when i give prep a shit load of time so what i save my producers on shoot which is the most expensive section of filmmaking i sort of use in prep so this film had five nearly five months of prep but we Goodness, shot it in okay. a okay wow we shot and it in a short 30 days oh wow days. okay because I, okay. films like these are really hard even for a studio to justify to the people they report to because a film like this although yes you have manoj bajpai it's a very hard sell even for a studio yeah Because yeah i mean you feeling good about anything so yeah. therefore i owe it to them to make it in a record number of days but then i fight yeah. for my time the other thing is because i don't know how many people will notice some of the other actors who are lesser known in the film who have done such an amazing job uh amuchaki uh, uh, mr bhav sir he he is such a he's a breakout star in the film i all i can say is i mean i i i will say i'll admit uh, completely clueless i had not heard of him i had not even known if he has acted before if anything else and it was just the scene no, in this film from, is a from bombay yeah. i had made a short film called cycle around okay. the same situation which has recently released online mm-hmm. and uh, i had produced it myself and just made it with all my resources because nobody would give me money to make a film that dark yeah. and it's a little like ugly bar it's out there political So in the process yeah. of casting that film in Bhopal uh mm-hmm. we found Jackie and okay. the kind of commitment and the strange energy i saw in the guy so he's interestingly he's one of maybe three or four people in this film who have been cast without an audition because wow. i was i was yeah. like he is this guy he's going to be able to do it yeah and i i'm 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 at, i'm actually speechless because usually uh, you have an idea of what kind of performance to expect from a certain actor uh this person just was on screen and whenever he was on screen mm-hmm. i just couldn't look away and and you know i was just like looking up and like there, there there has to be some other credit for this guy you know this can't be just you can't just be on the screen and uh, literally take my breath away so congratulations to jacky he is exceptional i hope this becomes a stepping stone for a lot of work I for him so. he's been around so, he's been I hope yeah, this... that and also uh, Smita Smita Thambe, who plays the local politician. Uh, what yeah. what an amazing, grounded yeah. performance! What an arc for the character. Firstly, She's but incredible. what an understated way to play that arc. There there were there's so many choices as an actor that you can make with that yeah. arc that you're given. And like you rightly said, there is there are many tropes associated with the revenge story arc, but the way uh, she chooses. her little minute decisions i felt this was exactly what this character needed to have made that choice i never felt this was smita acting i felt at this point this is that character making that choice and for me to kind of feel that uh, where this uh, actor was trying to showcase a very i would say conventional revenge story but i never at any point felt this character was out for revenge i felt this character would make these choices because this is what this character was meant to always do i mean this is what this character was supposed to be and for that for me to feel that for me to genuinely 
believe it on screen uh it's it's amazing uh, uh, apart from both jackie and, and smita i mean both of you are absolute stars i am so glad and i know a lot of other people will talk about other uh, performances but i just wanted to highlight both of you because both of you have done amazing exceptional work in the film and i really really wish you get a lot more work because uh, i had to look up your credits and just was like where are you guys you know where is your filmography of 100 films being a veteran and i could not find that so it was really sad but thankfully uh, you know this film is hopefully a better signs to come she's you know, been right she was an ajji i don't know if you noticed yeah yeah i did but i mean this arc like you said you know the obviousness of the trope makes it even more difficult right i mean we already know the the arc that this character is supposed to go through which makes it more challenging to keep it interesting right so the fact that she makes choices which surprised me even though i knew the outcome right makes it uh, you know uh, more interesting and and just uh, now i know then i know whenever they pop up it's like ah i've seen this and it, it, it's like you know you you kind of become that kind of uh, your your brain starts to capture that person you know whenever they first broke out so you know this is the kind of thing when 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 as an audience member when you rewatch them again you like oh i remember this guy from this uh, scene and re- and you kind of are also part of their journey uh, you know i don't know if a lot of uh, audience members take it that way but i feel very personally connected whenever i see a star who has a breakout performance and then they go on to do better and bigger projects and then i'm like aha but do you remember that uh, pankaj tripathi mm-hmm. doing that kabwa biryani scene in run before mm-hmm. he became pankaj tripathi or you know so it's it's like uh, it's like that or do you do you see do you remember nawaz in sarfarosh in that one scene before he became nawaz so it's like you you have that imprint in your mind in every other subsequent uh, milestone that these characters and actors hopefully get then becomes then you feel personally invested in their journey because you feel like you've seen them grow literally in front of your eyes so from that perspective both jackie and smita i just wanted to take mm-hmm. uh, my time to give them a shout out because i don't know how many other people with manoj and both uh, um, mama ji said is an ayub and even uh, rachi that deshpande she's she's there but they're all known faces i was expecting good things from them i was not expecting anything from these guys which is not to say that i was expecting bad things i was just not expecting anything so i just I didn't know you. what to expect uh, yeah. and they just blew me away on a film like this you can safely assume that everyone's been burned it was a really difficult film people have worked for next to nothing given like almost a year of their lives so this needs to be sweet for them as well that people are watching it and people are feeling what you are feeling while they're watching it so that was devashish makija director of joram having an exclusive chat with me when his film premiered at the sydney film festival now joram screens at geomami mumbai film festival twice firstly on 2nd november 7:30 pm at bkc mason pvr Geo World Drive, Audi Number Four, and the second screening is on third November at five PM at Juhu PVR Dynamics Mall, Juhu in Audi Number Two. Now the good thing about this is that that both screenings have an intro and Q and A, which usually means it's a wonderful time to sort of interact with the cast and crew, and I'm sure they will be there also to answer your questions after the film. uh juram is also having a wide release come december so you know a lot of opportunity to catch the film you can go and head on to hion films at www.hionfilms.com to read my review of juram spoilers i loved it i really think you should make time for this film a wonderful team at hion films are working around the clock to bring you insightful coverage of mami and beyond of a lot of other film festivals so follow hion films for a lot more film coverage